Okay, welcome everyone to another Getting to Know Japan webinar. Um, we're really happy to have you all here. And um, we're really thankful to the US Japan Foundation for, or sorry, the Japan Foundation of New York, our new sponsor um, for making this possible as we continue this webinar series in another year. So we're excited to um, keep learning about Japan alongside you all. Um, Today, we have a great presentation planned for you by Dr. Michael Bozak, who will be joining us um, to give a, an overview of Japan's constitution and government structure. Michael MacArthur Bozak is the Special Advisor for Government Relations at YCAPS and founder of the Parley Policy Initiative. Previously, Dr. Bozak served in the US Air Force as a foreign area officer. His last posting in the Air Force was at the Deputy Chief of Government relations at headquarters U.S. Forces Japan. Prior to that, Dr. Bozak was a Mansfield Fellow where he worked in the National Diet, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the Ministry of Defense. He completed his doctoral studies at the International University of Japan's Graduate School of International Relations, and he focused on alliance theory and intergovernmental negotiations. His other research areas include North Korean governance and foreign policy, post-war occupation policy and leadership studies. In years prior, the webinar series was off the record, but this year we will be recording each webinar and uploading it to our new YouTube channel. So that's just something to keep in mind during the Q&A session that this is no longer off the record. Now, please welcome Dr. Michael Bozak. Hey, good, every good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, good evening to those joining from elsewhere in the world. Let me start by saying it's my absolute pleasure to be kicking off the Getting to Know Japan webinar series for YCAPS. YCAPS is a wonderful organization, and thank you to Lucy and Amani for hosting me today. Now, I imagine that I have a pretty wide array of audience here. I suppose that there's some who are newcomers to the Japanese government, others who are familiar with it, maybe even worked with the government of Japan and are looking to gain more insights into the uh, machinations of the Japanese government, and others who are experts who are just waiting to grill me in the Q&A. Um, since I have a wide range of viewers today, what I'd like to do is offer two objectives for this presentation. The first is to offer the foundational knowledge needed to understand Japan's system of governance, just that foundational information uh, to be able to make heads and tails of what you're seeing in the press. The other is a, some information and insight that will help frame your thinking and your approach to the Japanese government, whether you're a student who's doing research whether you're a practitioner who is actually engaging with government Japan colleagues, or if you're just an observer of Japanese politics, who's trying to understand what you're seeing in the press or in the information space. Now, to do this, I'll offer about 30 minutes of remarks with a uh, slideshow presentation, and then I'll open up for about half an hour Q&A. So if you just bear with me for a moment here, I'll go ahead and pull up the slides, and we'll go straight into it. Now, with any sort of government analysis, what I like to do is view government as a machine. And this helps frame our approach to understanding how this system works. You see, a machine is something that's built, put together in order to accomplish a certain function. Now, in the case of government, you're talking about delivery of goods and services or other civil administrative functions. And any machine, when you're looking at to, to break it down, is really four core elements. The first is the manual, the book that tells you what the machine is, what it's supposed to do, what the parts are, how it's supposed to all fit together, and how it's supposed to be operated. Now, in governments, when we think about the manual, typically we're talking about a constitution or a set of laws. And so that's the first element that you should look at when you're trying to understand a system of governance. The second element is the parts, the pieces and parts that all fit together to make that machine operate. When we're talking about a government, we're talking about things like institutions and offices, a legislature or Supreme Court or an executive. These are the parts that you would look at when you're trying to understand that system of governance. The third element are the operators. You see, you can take a manual, you can take a part, you know, all the parts, you can have these machines and give them to two different people and they're going to operate it completely differently. And the same principle applies with governments that every political party or a politician that may run that government may do so differently than somebody else who happens to be in power. So we have to look at the operators who are operating that machine. And then finally, we have to look at the mechanics, how this all works together, how those things all fit together to be able to allow the machine to run. And so that's how we're going to break down the presentation today by looking at these four elements. 
So when we look at Japan, we look at the manual, you start with the post-war constitution. Now, this is Japan's second constitution. The first was promulgated in 1868, known as the Meiji Constitution. The constitution that's in place today was promulgated in 1946 and went into effect in 1947. Now, why are those years important? It's because that was during the Allied occupation of Japan after World War II. And one of the criticisms that you'll hear about Japan's post-war constitution is that it was written by foreigners and imposed on the Japanese public. That's not exactly correct. But at the time, the occupation authorities requested the interim Japanese government authorities to create a new constitution. And they gave them a list of principles and said, these are the things that you need to incorporate in this new constitution. And what the Japanese interim authorities produced was a, uh, a basically just a amendment of the existing Meiji constitution. And it was rather unimpressive. To, ex to explain and offer an example of what I'm talking about here, this is probably the my favorite, most pertinent example here, and the section in the Meiji Constitution where it said that the emperor was sacred and inviolable. The proposed change to that was that the emperor is now supreme and inviolable. So needless to say, the general headquarters of the Allied occupation was not very impressed with this draft, and they said, well, we're going to flip the process around. Instead of the Japanese interim authorities producing a draft that we will review, We'll produce a draft and we'll give that to the interim Japanese authorities to review, and then we'll put that to a public referendum. And that's what happened. So the Japanese public voted on it. They agreed upon it. It went into effect in, uh, promulgated in 1946 and went into effect a year later. And importantly, despite the criticisms about the Japanese government, or excuse me, the Japanese constitution, it has never been amended. Some will argue that the reason why the Japanese constitution has never been amended is because the process for doing so is rather uh, onerous. There's a pretty high bar for how you would actually achieve a constitutional amendment. And others will say, well, actually, the constitution is not so bad. It incorporates some very important values inside the constitution that we would like to hold firm. Now, you see the picture on the lower right there. That's a picture of the opening session of the Diet in 1947. And the way that the parliament in Japan works is that the first rows are where the newcomers sit. And as you go further back into the rows in the parliament building, you get the more tenured uh, politicians who've held office. In that picture, there are the first two rows. You can see how many women are sitting in that, in that section there. That's because for the first time in Japanese history, under the new constitution, women were allowed to hold public office. And that's just one example of some of the new values that were incorporated into Japan's post-war constitution. Now, one that you're going to hear about a lot if you're dealing with Japan, especially when the realm of security and foreign policy is Article 9. Article 9 is the war renunciation clause of the Japanese constitution, which basically says that the Japanese, are, they, they give up the right of belligerency of the state and that they'll never maintain air, land, or sea forces. Now, if you look at the self-defense forces as they exist today, you'd say, well, scratch your head and say, well, how is that possible? And you have this article that says they can't maintain air, land, or sea forces, but they have this very capable, very robust self-defense force um, structure that's in place. It's important when you look at the Constitution that although it's never been amended, it has been reinterpreted over time. And so there's been several reinterpretations of the Constitution that have allowed Japan to be able to grow its self-defense forces into what you see today. And the final point I'll make about the constitution here is that it underwrites a parliamentary constitutional monarchy. And that will make more sense as we go through the next section here in terms of the parts. And we look at the parts of the Japanese government, we have to start with the major offices. And most governments will have a head of state and head of government. Sometimes it's the same person and sometimes they're different people. In Japan, the head of state is the emperor, Emperor Naruhito. Now, the head of state is a ceremonial function. The emperor has no uh, institutional power inside the government. The emperor will do ceremonial functions like convening the parliament or participating in state ceremonies. The actual head of government is the prime minister, currently Kishida Fumio. And the prime minister sits atop a cabinet. The cabinet has about 18 ministerial postings and about 57 sub-cabinet postings, which means state minister and parliamentary vice minister postings inside the uh, that sit atop the ministries and agencies in the Japanese government. The last office I'll mention here is the National Security Council, which was created in 2013 
to be able to uh, manage foreign policy and security affairs for the Japanese government. The next part I'll talk about is the legislature. Now, Japan has a parliamentary system, and so they have what's called a diet. And the diet is bicameral, meaning that there are two houses. I'll talk about the more powerful house first, and that's the House of Representatives, or you may hear it called the lower house. The lower house is comprised of 465 members who serve four-year terms. Japanese citizens who are 18 years or older have the right to vote in these elections, and those elections will happen every four years or upon dissolution of the House. Now, when they go to the ballot box, the Japanese are voting for two types of seats. You have single seat constituencies and proportional representation. And what that means is when they go to the election to, to vote in an election on the ballot, they write down two things. The first is a name, and that represents a candidate for a single seat district, and then a party, which is for the proportional representation. The way that proportional representation works is that there's a, a lot of number of seats that for a the, the more votes that a party gets, the more proportional seats that it will receive inside the, the diet. Now, the lower house, importantly, can be dissolved, and it can be dissolved if there's a two-thirds no confidence vote or a prime ministerial declaration. And what this means is that uh, over the past several decades here, there's only been one time that comes to mind that they've actually allowed the four-year term to expire before calling a general election. Generally speaking, the government that's in charge will seek the most, uh, the time that is best suited for them to be able to win additional seats, and they will dissolve the house and call for a general election. I'm gonna put up some unique characteristics about the lower house, but I'll just offer a key takeaway here, that the lower house is the more powerful of the two houses in the Japanese government. And part of that is based on politics and part of that is based on institutional power. I'll talk with about the politics first. Because the election cycles are more frequent in the lower house, Generally speaking, the political parties will choose politicians to be in the lower house who have a stronger foothold in their constituencies, have a greater propensity for being able to win elections. That gives them more power and influence in terms of politics. But then there's also institutional reasons because the lower house can override upper house decisions with a two-thirds majority, and the budget is begun in deliberation in the lower house, and that power of the purse is important. The other house that we'll talk about is the House of Counselors, or the upper house. This is a smaller house that only has 248 members, but they serve longer terms of up to six years. Again, the right to vote is for Japanese citizens 18 years or older, and they will go to the ballot box every three years for the House of Counselors, at which point 50% in the house goes up for vote. So the last time they had an election was last summer, and 124 seats were up for, uh, for election. Like the lower house, there are two types of seats inside the upper house. You have your districts again. Of course, these are plural seat districts rather than single seat. And then you have proportional representation. The same concept applies. And when they go to the ballot box, there's a name for a candidate and then a name for a political party that somebody will write down. Now, unlike the lower house, the upper house cannot dissolve. So when the lower house is in a period where it's constantly dissolving, you know, we had this period of you know, we call re uh, revolving door prime ministers uh, about 15 years ago. This was a uh, period where the upper house was able to gain a little bit more stature and influence because dissolution doesn't have in there. It tends to be the more stable of the two houses whenever there's a uh, period of uh, political tumult. Now, again, for some unique characteristics about the upper house. The upper house, one of the main goals for political parties is to make sure that they have, as, uh, they would like to get two thirds in the lower house and they'd like to get at least the majority in the upper house. And that way they can make sure that they can uh, maintain their legislative power. They can get laws that they want passed to get through the diet relatively easily. What that means for the political parties is that your lower house politicians will dedicate a lot of time to trying to get upper house candidates elected. So they'll go and stump for the upper house candidates. The other thing that they'll do is that they will pick candidates for the upper house who are more popular, who can generate some excitement. So not necessarily career politicians. You'll get people who are experts in their uh, relative field. So maybe there's a 
a self defense for former self defense force officer who's an expert on defense that they'll pull in to be a candidate for the upper house because they can bring that expertise to bear or maybe they'll pick movie stars or pro athletes or other celebrities because they can get votes and so the upper house tends to be a little bit more eclectic in terms of the composition than the lower house now to illustrate the fact that the upper house is the weaker of the two houses it's important to note that there has never been a prime minister from the upper house even though there's no institutional barrier for that happening so now we talked about the legislature, let's talk about the organization that helps draft the legislation and certainly is responsible for implementing it, and that's the Japanese bureaucracy. For any of you who've read any of the old literature on Japanese government from, say, the 1980s, you'll see about how strong the bureaucracy is in Japan. And although that's evolved over time, Japan does still have a relatively strong bureaucracy that has institutional power. Now, that power is distributed across the ministries, of which there are 11. And about 10 years ago, when I was working the Japanese government, I did an uh, informal survey with every office and every Japanese government official that I interacted with on a routine basis. And I asked them, I said, you know, where do you think that all the ministries rack and stack in terms of domestic power influence? And to the last person, the answer for number one and two was always the same. It was the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Export, Trade, and Industry, which makes sense because that's where the money's at, right? And to almost the last person, the answers for number three and four were generally the same. Number three was the Ministry of Land, Infrastructure, Transport, and Tourism, which is responsible for public works. You know, these pork barrel projects that might be built, you know, big bridges and roads out in these, these uh, far-flung prefectures in Japan. And number four was the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry, and Fisheries. Because you have these prefectures in Japan, these areas which are more rural in nature and are places where you can get uh, subsidies provided for these activities. So these were basically the, the first four from almost everybody I asked. Now, the next five fluctuated. And you can see here, depending on the issues, you know, maybe a little bit more power and influence. But almost the last person, the last two were always almost the same. And that was the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Defense. Now, for an American, you might think, well, geez, the Department of Defense and the Department of State being at the bottom of, in terms of domestic power and influence, it might seem a little absurd, but that's just the way it works in Japan for a number of reasons. One, because the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Defense are outward focused. Um, two, the Ministry of Defense is the newest of the ministries. It was only uh, came into being in 2008. And you know, historically, and I won't get too much into this session, you know, the relationship between the Japanese public and the Japanese security institutions, uh, you know, had a rough patch for the you know, immediate post-war era until more recent years here. Now, interesting thing about this note here is when I talked to my Ministry of Defense colleagues at the time doing this informal survey, every single one of them said, yeah, we're definitely dead last. <laughs> and when I talked to my Ministry of Foreign Affairs counterparts, they had a little bit of different answer. They would generally say, well, you know, we're not number one or two because, you know, Ministry of Finance and Medi, that's where the money's at, but maybe number three or four. Uh, but in reality, when you look at the Japanese government, you have to understand that fundamentally bureaucratic power rests in the purse and the ability to affect public works. So next we'll talk about the local governments, of which there's two categories here. The first is the prefectural governments. In Japan, you don't have states or provinces. You have what's called prefectures, of which there are 47. Now, the prefectures don't have the legislative power. You know, the legislative power rests with the central government, but they do have strong autonomy laws where they give them constitutional authority to be able to veto certain things that the central government's trying to do. And so oftentimes when you're looking at the political interplay between the central government and the prefecture, what you're seeing is the prefectural government trying to block or prevent the central government from doing some certain things inside their prefecture. The next category is municipal governments. Under the constitution, Japan is to have assemblies at every level of municipality from the smallest village to the biggest city. Now, the important thing about the municipal governments is that these are essential targets for delivery of benefits from the central government. And that exists under this unitary system of governments that the Japanese government has. And I'll explain that a little bit more when we get to the mechanics of it all. But first I'd like to talk about the operators the political parties that are in charge, that, that compete for power and run the Japanese government. 
slide you see here lists the major political parties in Japan as they exist right now in the order of diet seats, meaning the party with the most seats to the party with the fewest seats. The ones in green that you see on this, the, the presentation here, those are the members of the ruling coalition, the parties that are in charge of the government. The ones in purple are the opposition parties. The big dog in the Japanese government is the Liberal Democratic Party, and we'll dive into them a little bit more here. The Komeito is the junior coalition partner, has an important role in bolstering that coalition. And if you look through this list, you might see down there the Jap Japan Communist Party. And that shocks a lot of people. They think, well, Communist Party is active in Japan? Well, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, you might have seen a little bit more of this Japan Communist Party having relationship with the other communist parties in the world. Uh, they used to sing the old communist songs. But today, to understand that party, really, you got to look at it as a progressive party that has a branding issue. So let's talk about the Liberal Democratic Party now, though, because there's a lot of mis misunderstanding about this party. If you read it only about, about in commentary in the press, you might think, well, this is, this, this is the right wing party of Japan. Uh, that's not entirely true. And to understand this, we have to go back in time to when the Liberal Democratic Party formed. You see, at the time, it was in the 1950s, and the Communist Party and the Socialist Party, they were very popular. And so the, all the parties that were from the center left to the right wing in the Japanese political spectrum, they said, guys, we are splitting the vote. We are losing, and we're going to allow the Communist and the socialists to gain control of the government. We can't let that happen. And so you saw these central left to right wing parties decide that they're going to band together. The two biggest parties of which were the Liberal Party and the Democratic Party, hence the Liberal Democratic Party. And those political ideologies still exist today, that spectrum from central left to right wing. And you can see it basically broken down inside the Liberal Democratic Party. They have these groups called factions. These factions are institutionalized groups, and they are actually remnants of these old political parties that all banded together, and you can still see the breakdown uh, inside the, the party today. Now, the LDP has dominated Japanese politics since 1955. There's only been two instances where the Liberal Democratic Party fell out of power, uh, once in the mid-90s and then another time in 2009 to 2012. The LDP has been able to maintain its control over the Japanese government for many reasons. You can see them listed here. The first is the unitary system of governance. This unitary system allows the central government to reach down directly to a municipal district to be able to provide benefits or to deny benefits, which allows them to either uh, choke off the opposition candidates that may have uh, a stranglehold on that seat or to entice voters to, to vote for an LDP candidate. The other factor is in party apparatus. See, the LDP is a big party, and there's over a million registered members across Japan, which means that anytime there's an election, they get the members of the party to go get butts out of seats and get them to the ballot box so that they can vote for LDP candidates. The third element is the absence of polarizing policy differences from the opposition. So unlike the United States, where you have major position issues like gun control or abortion, those sorts of pulse, posi uh, position policy issues do not resonate in Japanese politics the same way. And so really you have debates over valence issues like the economy and, and how you should manage foreign policy. But it's not as polarizing where you can say, here's this party that represents one set of ideology and here's another party that represents another set. So absent that, it becomes a question of, do people have faith that the LDP can run the government or should they go to somebody else? And in general, stability from having the LDP uh, run government has prevailed since 1955. The next uh, element here is the internal checks and balances. You see, when a LDP leader is falling out of favor with the Japanese public, what the LDP will do is they'll simply oust that leader. They'll get rid of that prime minister and they'll bring somebody new in and they'll refresh it. And they can go, they have the political spectrum there. They could pick somebody who's more left of center or somebody who's more uh, hawkish on the right, right side of the political spectrum. So they have those candidates inside the party and they can shift back and forth depending on the uh, political sentiments of the time. And then finally, the coalition with the junior coalition partner, the Komeito, is very important. 
like the LDP, the Komeito has a massive vote getting apparatus. Now, theirs is different. The Komeito is connected to it with an organization called the Sokugakai, which is a, a Buddhist organization that has many, many members all over Japan. And so anytime there's an election, the Komeito will get those members to go to the, the election booth and they'll say, you're going to vote for a Komeito candidate, or if there's no Komeito candidate here, you're going to vote for an LDP candidate. And so this massive vote generating apparatus has helped the LDP maintain power, uh, particularly over the past 20 years of the coalition. So with all this in mind, let's talk about how this all functions together. And to really start this understanding of the mechanics of Japanese government, I want to start by discussing the unitary system of government and compare it to the federal system. You know, to use an example, the United States has a federal system and Japan has a unitary system. So in the federal system, you have a federal government that has to go through a state government that then goes down to the city governments. In a unitary system, you have a central government that can bypass the prefectural government and go to directly to the municipal governments. Now, this is very important when you talk about subsidies and public works projects and things that would be um, trying to curry political favor from local constituencies. But they don't have to necessarily go through a prefecture to be able to do that. And that plays out on a lot of policy making. And you'll see that play out in the uh, any time that you're watching things happen at in, in the information space relative to the Japanese government. But let's talk about policy making and uh, you know legislative action here. And while this the Japanese government doesn't formally break it down into uh, you know branches of government like you see here, this is the way that I help make sense of it in my own mind, and hopefully it's useful for you. So you can look at the Japanese government as the legislature, the executive, and the bureaucracy. We'll start with the legislature. So when in the LDP will come up with these policy priorities, these these ideas for legislation. The junior coalition partner, the Komeito, injects its preferences into the LDP's policy designs. And so that's how the Komeito is a junior coalition partner. It doesn't have a whole lot of policymaking influence, but it, it exercises its rights as the coalition partner to try to influence the LDP's policy priorities. The LDP will communicate its policy priorities through the Conte. The Conte is the equivalent of like the White House or 10 Downing Street. It's the prime minister's residence that also serves as the prime minister's office. So the prime minister and his immediate staff will determine the policy priorities for the Japanese government based on the direction, the guidance from the, the party writ large, as well as the prime minister's personal policy preferences. And that will be communicated through the cabinet secretariat. The cabinet secretariat was created to sit atop the bureaucracy. Like I said, in Japan, you had a very strong institutionalized bureaucracy. And so uh, eventually the Japanese government said, well, we need to create something that will corral all these bureaucrats. They created this cabinet secretariat to be a policy coordinating body that sits atop all the ministries and agencies. The cabinet secretariat will, will communicate the, the prime minister's guidance. Uh, to the individual ministries and agencies, also through the cabinet ministers, who can then generate legislation or generate policy that will then be communicated through the cabinet ministers back to the national diet, where laws will be deliberated, passed, et cetera. Now, the opposition parties only have one place to be able to really influence this, and that's inside the diet itself. Uh, and that's why there's a lot of criticism over the effect effectiveness of opposition parties to really change uh, what's going on in terms of Japanese decision making, uh, but that's that's their one venue for being able to do so. And the one entity you see on the slide there I haven't mentioned yet is the National Security Secretariat. This is a relatively new office that was created. It supports the National Security Council, and its importance will wax and wane depending on how much the Prime Minister leverages this institution. And it's relatively young, uh, you know, created in 2013. But they're responsible for foreign policy and security coordination. So any of you viewers out there who are interested in, in those elements, you know, should take notice of the National Security Secretariat and its roles in, uh, in, in managing Japanese government policy making and legislative priorities. I'll uh, end with this presentation um, in terms of the new information here with how to become the prime minister in Japan. And this is important because it helps you understand the internal strife that may occur inside the Japanese government. 
you know, when we talk about uh, a prime minister being in the danger zone, why is the prime minister in the danger zone? Or, or we talk about uh, internal party strife in terms of power struggles. And it fundamentally breaks down to how somebody takes control of the nation's top job. And really to become prime minister, you must win a majority of a majority. And what that means is your party has to win a majority of the diet seats. And then you as a candidate have to win a majority of the votes from within the party of the coalition. Because of this, what it means is that your party or coalition can oust you. They, if they control the majority of the diet and they think that you're not doing a great job, they just say, well, we're going to get rid of you. We're going to vote for a new prime minister to come in. And this was really relevant when you saw from between 2006 and 2009, this period of revolving door prime ministers, you had a new prime minister every year. And even when we look at recent past, you had Abe Shinzo, and then you had Yosh- uh, Suga Yoshihide, who only served for a year as the prime minister. And now you have Kishida Fumio. And the question is, is well, how long is Kishida going to last, uh, depending on what the LDP may decide it wants to do in terms of its leadership priorities? Now, Kishida is doing all right right now in terms of public uh, opinion uh, polls, but you know that could change and we'll see what happens. There's a major election this month, actually, a series of elections called the April Unified Elections. We can talk about more in the Q&A if you want to. Uh, but what it means is that the political fortunes can change very quickly, and the the uh, leader atop the Japanese government can swap out relatively quickly as well. All right. So let's just recap real quick here everything we talked about for the past half hour or so. Japan has a liberal constitution since 1947. This constitution provides for a bicameral legislature, and in that legislature, the House of Representatives or the lower house is institutionally the more powerful house of the two. Japan has a powerful bureaucracy, and that power skews towards the ministries that control the money inside the government. There are assemblies at every level of government, meaning the central government, the national level, the prefectural level, and the municipal level. And they operate in a unitary, not a federal system, which means the central government can deal directly with the municipal governments as it wishes. And then finally, the, the, the Japanese government has been a de facto single party system since 1955 with the LDP controlling the government for the entire span, except for two uh, blips that you've seen in the past seven de- or past six decades. So with that, we'll go ahead and uh, close this out, and I'll go ahead and open up for Q&A. I hope uh, you were able to get some good information from those the uh, remarks so far. Thank you, Dr. Bozak. Bozak. Um, if you wanted to keep your PowerPoint up to refer to, that's fine, but if not, that's okay. Um, we have some great questions going on in the chat for you. Um, First, I wanted to ask, uh, you said the National Security Council was not created until 2013 and the Ministry of Defense was created in 2008. Was there some event or some societal change that was going on during that time that um, caused these two big things to be created? So I will get into this now. So we have to understand that the civil military relations in Japan uh, was heavily influenced by this notion of the runaway military uh, that led Japan to you know, go after the greater East Co, uh, greater uh, East Co- East Asia co prosperity sphere. You know, the the Japanese uh, War of Conquest that happened in the uh, early to mid 1900s. Uh, you know, culminated with the uh, World War II and the atomic bombs. And you know, for the Japanese, it was a massive change. With the Allied occupation, the, the course of the seven-year occupation, the massive demilitarization effort, the institution of a new liberal democracy uh, underwritten by a uh, constitution that has liberal values, the notion that they are going to renounce the right of belligerency of the state, it created a, a massive change in terms of civil military relations. And for decades, there was a very tenuous relationship between the Japanese public and the Japanese defense architecture inside the government uh, for, you know, many, many years, the self-defense forces were not respected in the Japanese government. In fact, uh, the Japanese public, they had a name for the self-defenses, self-defense forces. They were called Zeikin Dorobo, tax thieves. Um, it was, uh, you know, not a great 
position to be in if you were a self-defense force member between, you know, 1954 when the self-defense forces were created and, and really up until the mid 90s. Something changed in the 1990s, though. You had two major events in 1995, where basically, and an one self-defense force officer intimated to me this way. He said, you know, 1995, the SDF went from the, the self-defense force that did nothing to the self-defense force that did everything. Uh, 1995, you had uh, the Hanshin earthquake in Kobe, and then you had the Serengeti gas attacks in Tokyo, the Omshinikyo sarin gas attacks, terrorist attacks. And the self-defense forces were called to do humanitarian assistance disaster relief in response to the Kobe earthquake. And they were called to do a chemical response in response to the sarin gas attacks. And the Japanese public said, well, there's actually great utility in the self-defense forces at this point. Another thing that happened in the early 90s was the passage of the peacekeeping operations law by the Japanese government. They realized that they had to do more uh, internationally as well. They had to put boots on the ground uh, with the self-defense forces to be a global player. And so you saw this desire to start putting the uh, self-defense forces uh, into these international operations. So the 90s saw this major change start to happen in terms of the evolution of the self-defense forces. And what we saw is the institutions catching up to that. And so from 19, you know, 1950s to the, uh, the mid-2000s, you had the Japan Defense Agency that was responsible for the policymaking legislation related to the self-defense forces. And then the Japanese government said, well, we need to upgrade that from an agency to a ministry. And that's where you saw the BOE show, the Ministry of Defense created. Uh, for the National Security Council, they had kind of a, a nebulous form of that. It was created in the 1980s. Uh, they had versions of it that was kind of used. But what they decided in 2013 is that they were going to actually legislate a U.S. style National Security Council. And that was part of this package of, uh, of security changes that, that the Japanese government wanted to institute um, during Abe Shinzo's prime ministership, which started in 2012. And so there was a series of changes in terms of their security legislation, security policies that were being implemented during that time. And that's when the NSC came about. And one more question on that topic, and then I'll get into some listener questions about the diet. Um, what bureaucratic process um, did they have to go through to increase the defense budget this past year? Well, they, I mean, they're still, they're going to have to go through a lot of processes at this point. So right now what they did was they, they published three security documents last December. They published a new national security strategy. They published, uh, you know, it used to be called the Boy Taiko, the National Defense Program Guidelines. Now it's just a national defense strategy. And then they published um, what used to be called the Midterm Defense Program uh, is now called the, the Defense Buildup Program. And basically it's a five-year plan for the new acquisitions that they're going to, to bring in to be able to achieve their objectives via the vis-a-vis -vis the national defense strategy and the national security strategy. So bureaucratically, they had to develop these three core documents, the, the strategies, and then the build-up program to be able to attain, to, to achieve the goals of those strategies. So that's the, that was a big major, a major muscle movement for the Ministry of Defense and National Security Secretary over the past year and a half or so. Uh, but now it comes down to the implementation of that strategy. And so the bureaucrats are going to have to continue working this. Part of this is justifying the budget increases that are going to have to happen. So I think the Ministry of Defense just published, I think it was like a 14-page document to be able to justify why the government has to double the defense spending for Japan. And the bureaucrats are going to have to generate responses because the cabinet ministers, when they get asked questions in the parliament, the cabinet ministers don't just willy-nilly answer whatever they want to at least not supposed to, uh, you know, in the system of governance, they're supposed to take the answers that are produced for them by the bureaucrats and read those out to the opposition parties. So the bureaucrats will be providing those answers to the cabinet ministers to, to articulate what's necessary now to be able to increase the defense spending and why. Okay, interesting. Um, I wanted to get to some questions, switch topics to the diet. Um, Kawamura san would like to know, um, it may sound trivial, but why is the Japanese legislative body called the Diet instead of Parliament? And before I moved to Japan, I was always under the impression that that was a Japanese word, but now I know it's not. Um, so where did that come from? 
So that actually extends back to the original Meiji Constitution. You know, in the Japanese, um, they had uh, the Meiji Restoration. Uh, you know, they they had a. You know, I'm going into the history. So Japan had a period of isolation under the uh, the the Tokugawa shogunate, um, and that isolation, known as Sakoku, um, you know, kept Japan closed off. Then, you know, famously, Matthew Perry steams into Shimoda Bay and and uh, you know forces Japan to open up. And the Japanese said, well, you know, we need to modernize. And so the Japanese government sent envoys to all around the world to learn about new systems of governance. And, and so what they did was they modeled the Meiji constitution off of the Prussian and British models. And so that's where the, the name, the diet came from was, I believe it was the old Prussian model, but it was from a European model for parliament. And they adopted that name. Of course, Kokai is Kokai. It's the Japanese name for it. But the name of the diet, diet comes from that old European model that was uh, studied during that period leading up to the uh, promulgation of the Meiji Constitution, 1868. Okay, I see. And then um, we have another listener who would want to know, did the two houses system originate with the second constitution or was it there before? It was there before. So it was the House of Peers and uh, I think it was the House of Representatives still, but um, yeah, I think now I'm going back into my history here, but it existed under the Meiji Constitution as well. Okay, and was the voting system roughly the same? No, absolutely not. So it wasn't. There was a peerage system that existed for the uh, the the Diet in the upper house. So you know, is is more akin to what you would see in in uh, in the English system with the House of Lords. Um, so the peerage system was modeled off of that in Japan. So it, you didn't have uh, you didn't have universal voting either. So only men were allowed to vote, and and so you know no you know universal suffrage. So the voting system was re, uh, was completely revamped with the the new constitution that went into effect in 1947. Okay. Yeah. Last um, January, we did a webinar on feminism in Japan, and she talked a lot about the uh, women's suffrage movement in Japan. It was really interesting. Um, William wants to know how you see the role of minor parties in Japan's political system. How I see the role of minor parties. Well, I mean, just like any political system, uh, any sort of contestation is important. You need somebody who's going to challenge the authority that's in a government to ensure that you keep them honest. So that's very important to have that. Now, if you're talking about the role of minor parties in terms of actually trying to wrest control away from the you know ruling coalition, that's a different story. And and part of the issue is going to be you know when you look at the opposition, the challenges that they have is uh, you know uh, kind of they they posture themselves as the we're not the LDP parties. And that's you, know, you should vote for us because we're not the LDP, which is different than if you're saying. You know, we are these parties that espouse these principles, these policy ideals, and that's why you should vote for us is the merits of our policies, not just because we're not the other guys. Um, so that's something that, you know, in terms of Japan's opposition parties, they they continue to do soul searching. Um, you have this party called the Constitutional Democratic Party of Japan. When they were that party was created in 2017, it was actually really encouraging for those who wanted a party that would espouse more progressive or liberal views than maybe the LDP was centering on. And uh, they they touted these this kind of different policy priorities and platforms. But then what happened was they started losing seats, and so now they've kind of changed their tune, and they're still soul searching. And really, they've become more of a center centrist party that looks a lot like the LDP, but, uh, you know, it's just different. They say, we're not the LDP. So vote for us with the CDPJ. So I, I think that that'll cover my answer for that one. I'm, I don't know if that answers it sufficiently, but that's what I'll go with. Sure. Um, on that same topic, I had a question about, uh, you mentioned 15 years ago, there was that era of the revolving door prime ministers. Um, did the Japanese people see that as like, um, like dysfunction? Did they lose faith in their government's like workings at that time? Or was it just seen as kind of business as usual, I guess? No. So that, I mean, that was the reason why the LDP lost power in 2009. They had a lot of, 
um, issues from 2006 to 2009. Now, granted, it was accelerated by the Lehman shock that occurred, uh, you know, that tanked the economy. Uh, but, you know, really it started in 2006 with Abe Shinzo's first stint as prime minister. You know, when Abe came into power, he went in, he went full, you know, full bore on kind of this, uh, you know, I would say, uh, you know, kind of a hawkish stance. He wanted to amend the constitution. He wanted to change things with Japanese security. And he was moving way too fast in a way that wasn't incorporating uh, some of the other elements in the LDP and certainly the broader government. And you take that plus the fact that he had scandals with his cabinet ministers. One even resulted in a, a suicide. And so he gets removed from power. They bring somebody else in. Uh, uh, you know, Yasuo Fukuda, he isn't able to right the ship. Then they bring in Taro Aso, who's gaff prone. And it was just the, the Japanese public said, you know, enough's enough with the LDP. And they had another party at the time, the DPJ, the Democratic Party of Japan, um, was able to, to present themselves as a viable alternative to the LDP. So the Japanese public voted for the DPJ to take power. But the DPJ, unfortunately, uh, you know, for, for them, unfortunately for them, uh, they weren't able to, you know, manage the, the government in such a way that would allow them to maintain the faith of the Japanese public. And so 2012, the LDPs, using that massive vote generating apparatus, was able to regain control of the Japanese government. And you mentioned, so that's, the, that's one of the times that the LDP yeah. lost power, but what was the other time? That was the early 90s. So again, uh, it was a loss of faith in the LDP's ability to run the government uh, appropriately. It was a series of scandals that occurred uh, from the late 80s to the early 90s. And so a coalition of opposition parties presented themselves as a viable alternative to the LDP. The Japanese public uh, latched onto it. But like the DPJ, uh, they quickly lost the faith of the Japanese public. And then the LDP was able to use this massive vote generating apparatus to regain control of the government. OK, I have one more question about um, voting from our listeners, and then I want to go into some more recent news stories. Um, Brian wants to know how this how are the seats filled for the proportional votes? You mentioned that a voter selects a politician and then a party at the ballot box. But can you go into a bit more detail about how those votes then translate into seats? Yeah, so I'm not I'm not a math guy, so I can't explain exactly how the proportional system breaks down in terms of numerical breakdown of the seats. But the basic principle is the more votes that a party gets, the more seats that it will get. Now, it's not just a straight proportion to say, well, you received 70% of the proportional ballots, so you get 70% of the seats. It's it's much more nuanced than that. But I can't really, I'm, I'm not capable of explaining exactly how the math breaks down. But the basic principle is the more votes you get, the more seats you'll get apportioned based on the proportional representation system. Okay, gotcha. Um, shifting gears, we have a question about the Unification Church. And I just wanted to mention that in two weeks, we will have a webinar on the relationship between religion and politics in Japan. But um, I wanted to hear your thoughts. Um, uh, Moeka Ida said, there has been much discussion about the relationship between state and religion with scandals around the Unification Church. How do you see this topic? Um, and what do you think of Komeito's position in this regard? Uh -huh. Yeah, so I mentioned that the Komeito has a formal relationship with the Soka Gakkai, which is a Buddhist organization. Now, one of the key principles, and I talked about the GHQ in the Allied occupation, one of the key principles when they, they said we need to change Japan's constitution is that we need to make it a secular state, meaning that there needs to be a separation of church and state. And under the Meiji constitution, that the notion that the emperor, uh, you know, was inviolable based on the Shinto religion was something that the GA HQ tried to separate and said, well, we can't have that anymore. It's a very difficult situation. And I, you know, I can't comment on the, the legislative positions of the Japanese government on the, uh, you know, relationship between the Komeito and Soko Gakkai or the LDP and the Unification Church. What I'll just say, though, is that, you know, there's a, you know, relationship that occurs between organizations and the political parties. And that's how I think that the average politician looks at it is not necessarily like I'm a, you know, believer in the unification church and therefore I'm going to get unification church votes. 
is that the Unification Church is an organization that wants to seek, uh, you know, leverage its relationship with the LDP to get certain, you know, benefits out of it. Now, for the Unification Church, the benefit was being able to say, hey, we're a legitimate organization that has ties to these politicians. That's the benefit they gained from it. Meanwhile, the LDP, you know, gained the benefit of having, you know, Unification Church members go and vote for LDP candidates or to participate in in uh, election campaigns. So that was the relationship there that came to light, uh, you know, in some of the the candidates that you that were discussed when the, the whole scandal broke out last summer. For Soka Gakkai, like I said, that's a that's a, a subject that I think uh, some of the other YCAP special advisors will be able to address. Uh, I think uh, you have Levi's going to talk about Kometo a little bit more uh, in depth in another Getting to Know Japan webinar series. So I'll leave that to him. Uh, but yeah. just for me, when you look at the system of governance, look at it like religious these religious organizations as groups, the groups that help fuel the votes. And that's why the political parties have relationships with them. So as someone who was who has been monitoring Japanese politics and government for a while now, um, that scandal about the Unification Church, was that did that come as a surprise to you or did you kind of see see it simmering and um, coming to a head? Uh, well, I mean, the assassination of Abe Shinzo was a complete shock. That that's mm-hmm. like, make no surprise. Make no make no mistake about it. That was a surprise to everybody. And the fact that the assassination was tied to the Unification Church is what blew this whole thing open and and really got people to look at it. But it's not surprising to me that you have organizations in Japan that seek to leverage political relationships for their own benefits. So that's not a shock to me. Um, you know, as, as far as do, was I paying attention to the Unification Church before the scandal broke out? And I, I really wasn't. Um, it was another group that existed in Japan, just like some other religious organizations. So, uh, you know, uh, it was just the fact that that incident sparked it and it became a political issue, a political scandal, which was able to unveil some of the other unsavory elements about the Unification Church, which made it even more intriguing for the media and the information space to break into. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for one or two more questions. So one more about um, recent scandals. Vivian wants to know, how did Ga Shi, uh, who was being investigated for crimes, even get elected to the upper house? And for those of you who don't know, this is a former member of the House of Counselors, Yoshikazu Higashitani, Mm -hmm. um, a YouTuber. and he's since been expelled because he had been overseas escaping from the police and failed to attend any of the sessions. Yeah, that's a, there, there's some nuance there in terms of being able to hold diet seats, and not be arrested while you're holding a diet seat versus if you have pre-existing crimes. And, you know, it's, it's really interesting because if you look in Japanese political history, there's been a lot of politicians who, you know, have been able to escape convictions based on their political connections. You know, even there's a prime minister, his name is uh, Tanaka Kakue, who is actually, uh, you know, the prime minister of Japan. He got caught up in a major scandal, the Lockheed scandal, and uh, his driver committed suicide. He was being in- investigated. He got indicted, but he never got put in prison um, because there are some pr- protections that you have as diet members once you're in the diet. And that's really to prevent, you know, a government from being able to throw opposition politicians into jail, right? So that's to protect them from any sort of uh, indictment for political crimes. But that does play out in terms of other crimes too. But how did this guy get elected? Well, you know, he you, you have, you can't be indicted, you can't be a criminal when you're applying, you're, you're putting in for your candidacy. To be a candidate, you have to be able to submit a deposit, which is about a $30,000 deposit, for a national level election. And then you can throw your name in the ring and your hat in the ring. And anybody can do that. There's no prohibition. If you have the money, you just need to register. And so you'll see some off the wall candidates who go there, put the deposit down. Uh, sometimes Wait, just sorry, for publicity. The deposit is $30,000 or yen? $30,000, which oh, if wow. you translate it to yen, I can't know. I, uh, it's about, you know, what I should say is about $26,000. It's what, you know, 30 million yen, whatever the, the conversion is, um, which is really important because when you talk about why the opposition is not able to take control of the government, I didn't really get into this level of detail, but being able to generate candidates is very difficult for national level elections because of how expensive it is. You have to have 
money to be able to do this. And this also ties into things like the Unification Church and these organizations that might donate money because you need money to, to field candidates. You need candidates to be able to win seats. And so this is part of that system of governance that, that helps perpetuate the LDP single party rule. But that's why, so get, you know, Gashi, why he was able to, to get it. He had the money, he had the support from a political party, he won the seat, realized that he was going to get, uh, you know, indicted. So he stayed away from the diet. Okay. Yeah. It sounds like he had a lucrative YouTube career before yeah. this. That's where yeah. he kind of got the money. Yep. All right. One last question um, before we get into upcoming YCAPS events. David wants to know what role has judicial review played in the past and is that changing? So it's interesting because when you think about this, if you're using an American system, you think about the legislature and you think about the Supreme Court. Japan has a Supreme Court. But when you talk about interpretation of the, con the Constitution, that actually goes to an organization called the Cabinet Legislative Bureau. And so the Cabinet Legislative Bureau does the, the interpretations of the Constitution. And so when the Constitution was reinterpreted in 2014, it was the Cabinet Legislative Bureau that did that, not the Supreme Court. So if you're talking about judicial review, you have to bifurcate those two things. You have to separate the ones that are actual judicial review in terms of you know, the implementation of laws and then the, the review in terms of the uh, constitutionality or the interpretations of the Constitution. Okay, gotcha. Well, that was our last question. So once again, I wanted to thank you for um, sharing your time with us and your expertise. Um, and before people head out, I just wanted to share some upcoming YCAPS events with you guys. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We will be uploading these um, Getting to Know Japan webinars to our YouTube each week. So you might have to bear with us the first time as we figure out how to do that and edit the video and everything. But you can find them at, at YCAPS Japan on YouTube. And um, our next Getting to Know Japan webinar will be about Japan's political landscape. Um, and that's Thursday evening next week with Professor Michael Kuchek from um, Temple University. Um, so perhaps we can get a bit more in the weeds about the election system then. And the next one I mentioned earlier, um, Tuesday, April 18th at 10 a.m. is about the intersection of religion and politics in contemporary Japan. So we did this one last year. But since then, we've had a lot happen um, in that sphere with um, Abe's assassination, the Unification Church. So we'll get into that a bit more. And we have an in-person event in Sasebo coming up Tuesday, April 18th in the evening. Um, and that will be with Dr. Ryo Hinata Yamaguchi, which some of you might remember as our Japan and North Korea speaker for this event or for this series. Um, so it should be an interesting time and there will be refreshments and networking and um, Q&A session. So we hope to see you there either on Zoom or in person at our next YCAPS events. Thank you again, um, Dr. Bosak, for presenting and thank you to our program sponsor, Japan Foundation New York, for making this series possible. Thank you everybody for joining today. Have a great day, everyone.